Good morning and welcome to my third video in thermochemistry, calorimetry, and molar enthalpy calculations. Building on what we've done previously with heat transfer and simple enthalpy calculations. These of course are Alberta Learning's knowledge outcomes and hopefully you're keeping track of how you're progressing. A calorimeter is a simple device used to conduct a great deal of thermochemical work. <coughs> Excuse me, get a bit of a cold today. There are various types of calorimeters, including a coffee cup, an aluminum can, or a bomb calorimeter. Uh, the last of these is beyond this course. A coffee cup calorimeter is exactly what it sounds like. It's a styrofoam cup with a lid on it. Um, it's designed to approximate an isolated system, preventing energy and matter loss to the universe outside the cup. Inside the cup is a solution of chemicals immersed in water. Uh, the important thing here is that the chemicals represent the system, while the water is the surroundings to the system. So even though there's no physical barrier between the two, system and surroundings are both included in the solution. Um, we do our chemistry inside this aqueous environment, and we measure temperature changes of the water uh, as the chemical system moves from reactants to products. That's the experimental piece in this work. An aluminum can is even simpler. It's filled with water with a heat source under it. Uh, and again, in, in, in both cases, we determine the thermal energy change of the water by measuring, it, measuring its temperature change. Of course, temperature change gives us energy change of the water, and we equate this with enthalpy change of the chemical system using delta H equals negative Q. We can go one step further though because we control how much of the chemical is used in the reaction. And therefore we can determine a molar enthalpy change, a delta HM for the chemical system using the formula delta HM equals delta H over N. Delta HM of course is our molar enthalpy change, delta H is our total enthalpy change, and N is number of moles of chemical used. A common type of molar enthalpy calculation is known as heat of solution or molar enthalpy of solution. The solution process, however, arguably is not a chemical reaction at all. If you think about it, we're talking about a salt being dissolved in the water. If you evaporate off the water, you get the salt back in its original state. On the other hand, you do break ionic bonding in the salt when you dissolve it, and you disrupt hydrogen bonding in the water at the same time. It also involves water bonding to, to ions in solution. So, in a sense, bonds are being broken and formed. So, arguably, it's a chemical reaction. I don't think it is, but I wouldn't argue too strenuously with those who do. And here's an example of a molar enthalpy solution problem. If you have 4.00 grams of potassium chloride dissolved at 150 mils of water, and you have a temperature decrease of 8.70 degrees Celsius, they want you to calculate the molar enthalpy change for the potassium chloride. The first piece of these is similar to what we've seen in the heat transfer problems. We determine the energy change for the surrounding water. And again, we start with our equation, Q equals MC delta T, and then substitute in a couple of comments. You'll notice that the, the, we're dealing strictly with the water, the 150 mils of water. Keep in mind the theoretical basis for this work. The water is the surroundings, the chemicals are the system. So the potassium chloride is the system, and it doesn't factor into the heat transfer calculation. Of course, we have a conversion factor that gets us out of milliliters and turns us into grams. We've got our heat capacity for water, and we've got our change in temperature. Just a word on the, the value for the specific heat capacity. This question does not involve pure water. It involves a, a solution of potassium chloride in water. And you might think it would have a differing specific heat capacity, and it does. However, they're so close that we assume that all solutions that we'll use in this unit will have the specific heat capacity for pure water. So we'll be using the 4.19 value for all solutions that we deal with in this course. And there are a number of... Uh, approximations and assumptions like this that we use in this unit and I'll come up I'll take them up as we move along so here's our value for heat transfer negative five four six seven point nine five joules and it's it, it intuitively it makes sense we're dealing with a drop in temperature of the surrounding water so we should have a negative value 
what's happening is that energy is going into the potassium chloride to, to break its bonds. The enthalpy change then is equal and opposite to the energy change of the surroundings. So the enthalpy change of the potassium chloride is positive 5467.95 joules. Next we do a stoichiometry piece where we determine how many moles of potassium chloride we're dissolving in the water. And we know from grade 11, stoichiometry, n equals m over m, or little m is the mass used, and big M is the molar mass of the potassium chloride. We substitute in, and here's our 4.00 grams we use experimentally. We multiply by one mole over the molar mass of potassium chloride, and we get 0 .5, 0 0.0536 dot 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 moles of potassium chloride. Final step then is to determine molar enthalpy change. Molar enthalpy change equals total enthalpy change over a number of moles. We substitute in and get a value of just a little over 100,000 joules per mole. Applying sig digs, and if we go back to the question, I believe it called for three sig digs, we get 1.02 times 10 to the 5 joules per mole. In English, we might say the potassium chloride gains 1.02 times 10 to the 5 joules per mole of enthalpy as it dissolves in the water. It's an endothermic process. Here's another. Uh, the difference uh, is that we're dealing with potassium hydroxide rather than potassium chloride, and we show an increase in the surrounding water of 18.70 degrees Celsius. The process, however, is the same. Heat transfer determination initially, Q equals MC delta T. Q equals mass of the water, again 150 mils, times our density conversion, one gram over one mil, times the specific capacity of water, times the change in temperature, and we get a heat transfer value. Enthalpy change for the potassium hydroxide is equal and opposite to the energy change of the water. Delta H equals negative Q. Therefore, delta H equals negative 11,752.95 joules. Number of moles of potassium hydroxide, N equals M over M. We got 4 grams of potassium hydroxide times 1 mole over the molar mass. We get 0 0.0712 dot 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 moles of potassium hydroxide. Molar enthalpy change, delta HM equals delta H over N. And we substitute our values in, and we get a molar enthalpy change of negative 1.65 times 10 to the 5 joules per mole. And again, the surrounding water is heating up. Potassium hydroxide must be losing enthalpy. Potassium hydroxide loses 1.65 times 10 to the 5 joules per mole of enthalpy as it dissolves in the water. Combustion reactions are also... Uh, familiar in calorimetry work. However, we can't put a flame underneath the styrofoam cup. So we substitute an aluminum can for the calorimeter. Sometimes we have to do the heat transfer calculation not only into the water in the can, but also into the aluminum can itself. Uh, sometimes not. Um, typically, if we see a specific heat capacity for aluminum and a mass value for the aluminum can in the question, they want you to do that piece as well. And I think this is such a question. Yeah. You got 100 mils of water in an aluminum can over a wax candle. And they show you the temperature increase of the water, 35.5 to 80.25. And they give you the mass of the aluminum can, 14.9 grams. They tell you the loss of mass of the candle at 0 0.500 grams. And they ask for the molar enthalpy of combustion for the, the, the chemical system. And they give you specific heat capacity for aluminum. So the, the, without telling you, they're inviting you to do a an energy calculation, a heat transfer calculation, not only on the water, but on the aluminum can. <clears throat> and we'll do both, and then I'll explain to you why they often ignore the aluminum can. So here's the heat transfer piece into the water as a first step. Q equals MC delta T. We substitute in, and we have a conversion factor, converting mils of water into grams of water. And we get our Q for the water. Then we do a heat transfer for the aluminum can and use the same formula. You'll notice here though that instead of the specific heat capacity for water, I'm using, excuse me, my mouse disappeared. We're using the specific heat capacity for aluminum, 0.897 joules per gram degree Celsius. Um, you'll notice the change in temperature to the aluminum can is the same, in te same as the change in temperature for the water. And this is another sort of approximation we use in calorimetry. Without measuring it, we assume that the average change in temperature of the calorimeter 
is the same as the change in temperature of the water. And the math works out quite nicely. Q for the aluminum can is 598.097 dot 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 joules. And notice the comparison. The, the water absorbs a great deal more energy than does the aluminum can. 18, 000, almost 19,000 against just about 600. And because of this, we typically ignore the calorimeter calculation because it's a very small portion of the total heat transfer. We often talk about it in terms of a source of air rather than a, uh, a heat transfer piece. And um, part of the reason, of course, is that the aluminum can has got a very small specific heat capacity compared to water. So does glass. So again, we often ignore thermometers and stir rods that are placed into the into the water to, to stir it around. In this question, we're not ignoring the aluminum can, so we have to do a heat transfer total by adding Q for the water and for the can. <clears throat> and we get a value at 19,348.347 dot 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 joules. The enthalpy change, of course, all that energy comes from the uh, candle wax, so delta H equals negative Q, and delta H equals negative 19,348.347 dot 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 joules. We have to determine moles of candle wax we've consumed using N equals M over M. And if I recall correctly, we burn 0 0.500 grams of candle wax. Yeah, 0 0.500 grams times one mole over the molar mass gives us 0 0.00141 dot 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 moles of candle wax consumed in the combustion. We do the molar enthalpy change, delta HM equals delta H over N. And hopefully you're seeing that we're sort of walking through the sta same steps in each of these questions. We plug in our values and we get a molar enthalpy change applying significant digits of negative 1.37 times 10 to the 7 joules per mole. The wax loses 1.37 times 10 to the 7 joules per mole of enthalpy as it burns. Um, we can take these questions a bit further and talk about percent error calculations. You know, we're not only heating water, we're not only heating the aluminum can. <clears throat> a tremendous source of error in these questions is the, the heat transfer into the atmosphere around the aluminum can. Now, we don't calculate that, we don't make that determination, but we do treat that as a, uh, as a source of error calculation, source of error discussion and a percent error calculation. So I'll do the same question again, except that on this occasion I will... Um, do a percent error calculation. To do so, I need a, a theoretical value. This is the enthalpy of combustion for candle wax accepted by reference sources. Negative 1.48 times 10 to the 7 joules per mole. And they want a percent error calculation. Well, here's our formula for percent error. It's the absolute value, which of course is the positive value, of the difference between what we determined in the lab and the theoretical value, which I'm giving you in this question. And then we divide that by the theoretical value and multiply by 100. You'll notice here that when I substitute into the equation, I'm substituting in my raw value from the previous question, not the rounded value after we've applied significant digits. And, then we, uh, and that's the general rule. We subtract the theoretical value. We um, divide by the theoretical value. And we end up getting... 7.76 percent error and again in terms of sources of error we cannot we can't count the aluminum can because of course we did that calculation um, we're talking about loss of uh, uh, heat to the environment a third type of uh, reaction that uh, uh, we do in these questions is molar enthalpy of neutralization here's a problem where we're mixing hydrochloric acid with um, sodium hydroxide. 55 mils of the first and 95 mils of the second and we're showing an initial temperature of 27.8 and a final temperature of 36.5 and the question is what's the molar enthalpy loss of the acid? They also want us to do a percent error calculation so they've given us a molar enthalpy of neutralization for the acid here. Negative 5.58 times 10 to the 4 joules per mole. First step then, let's determine the heat transfer into the surrounding solution, Q equals MC delta T. And you'll notice you're mixing two volumes of water together. 
55.00 mils and 95.0 mils. So the surrounding mass of the water is determined by adding those two volumes together and then converting into grams. So we have 55.00 mils plus 95.0 mils times uh, the density factor, one gram over one milliliter. Right? The, the surroundings in these neutralization problems represents the total volume mixed together. Then we multiply by the specific heat capacity of water, pure water, even though we're dealing with solutions, times the change in temperature, and we get a Q value at 5467.95 joules. Of course, the enthalpy change is equal and opposite to that, so the neutralization loses 5467.95 joules. Our next step is to determine the number of moles of, of acid used in the uh, neutralization. Uh, however, we use a slightly different formula um, from solution stoichiometry that moles of acid equals its, its concentration times its volume. Its concentration, 0.19, sorry, 1.90 moles per liter, times its volume. And the volume of the acid alone was 55.00 mils. We have a simple conversion factor here to get us out of mils and into liters. And that gives us a moles value of 0 0.1045 moles of hydrochloric acid. Our molar enthalpy change then, delta HM equals delta H over N, and we substitute in, giving us a value of the molar enthalpy change for the acid of negative 5.23 times 10 to the 4 joules per mole. The question called for us to do a percent error calculation. Oh, and then in English we say the molar heat of neutralization for the acid is negative 5.23 times 10 to the 4 joules per mole. Again, the question called for us to do a percent error calculation, which looks like this. There's our experimental value, and again it's the raw value taken from above, minus the theoretically accepted value, and divided by the theoretically accepted value, and we get a percent error of 6.23%. Sources of error, you're, you're probably going to have gas escaping from this system, carrying with it uh, energy, and you're, you're also heating the styrofoam cup to some degree. One final question. The molar enthalpy of solution for ammonium chloride. Um, I think I'll just leave this up for you to write down and to do on your own, and I'm going to conclude. We'll see you next time, and hopefully you found that helpful. Um, the trick here is to do as many of these questions as possible, and I'll refer you to any homework your teacher might give you in that regard. Um, next time I see you, um, we'll be discussing Hess's Law. Thank you very much.